Hey, everybody, how you doing? Well, that's good. Welcome to PHLY Flyers presented by Mortgage CS. Check out MortgageCS.com slash PHLY to start your home buying process today. Company and MLS ID number 1464766. My name is Bill Matz. I'm your director of fun and games today. I am joined by Philadelphia's number one hockey beat reporter, Charlie O'Connor, and Broad Street Hockey's own Kelly Hinkle. Long time no see. It's been a it's while. Just, yeah. uh, man, it's I, been like almost 12 hours. Yeah, first things first. <laughs> we should have, just move in together. I have to thank everybody uh, who joined us for our five-hour extravaganza yesterday, the pregame, the watch party, and the postgame show. Thanks, everyone, who came and hung out uh, for that, and thank you to Coors Light for making that happen. We are live at the Wells Fargo Center here in the Chill Zone, speaking of Coors Light, the for the zone. Flyers Charities Carnival, and I am pumped about it. It's always fun to get to participate in this. We're actually broadcasting live this year. It's a great time. We're going to have some amazing guests joining us. Keith Jones is going to be here. Dan Helford is going to be here. We're going to have several others. It's going to be a ton of fun. What wasn't fun, though, guys? Last night. <laughs> the, uh, the game, the, the result of the game last night. Not was great. less than ideal. Considering, like, it was a roller coaster of a game. Because it was, oh, well, this is better than expected. Oh, this is this is the blowout I was expecting. Oh my God, there's hope. Ah, oh, God damn it. <laughs> like that was the entire uh, you know, ride we went on. How are we feeling about this team? A few hours removed, uh, and we got at least some sleep since then. <laughs> How are we doing? Uh, just looking ahead for this next. There's a month left in the season. A month. Yeah, it ends it's April sixteenth. Yeah, it's about Oof. a month. This season ends later. Yeah, I, I I thought they were going to be back to a normal schedule, the NHL. I mean, but it seems like yet again they're ending the season later than normal because There's usually weaker, weaker, usually it ends half. around like April eighth, April 9th, yeah. So I don't know why they added another week. Who knows? In terms of the Flyers, though, I mean, I don't come away from that Boston game feeling like they played terribly. I think they played pretty well for two periods, as I said last night, had a three-minute lapse that Boston took full advantage of, and then Felix Sandstrom couldn't make a big stop, which essentially made it impossible for them to win the game. Now, the frustrating part about it is that you really needed to grab a point, yeah. given yeah. the schedule they're in. If this was in the middle of a normal slate of games, I would say, oh, well, that's a bummer. But given the teams they're playing over the next week and a half— they really, really could have used that point, especially with how tight the Metro and the uh, the wild card race is getting. Now, we talked about it last night, like along this stretch of seven games, especially considering the injuries on the blue line, the goaltending situation. You're going to just you're just hoping if you want to get into the playoffs to steal a few points here and there. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. after this stretch is over, kind of regroup and see if you can start backing a few more. Uh, actual, you know, victories. <laughs> but last night is frustrating simply because that was one of them. All right, you played uh, better than expected through 40 minutes. You're tied going into the third. This is one of the games we can come away with something to help us. And instead, you lose in regulation. Like, it's just a bummer. More than, like, I'm not mad. <laughs> I'm just like, yeah. ah, like, I feel bad for them. They clearly worked their asses off they last did. night to like, make the comeback viable a few times and to play with them through the first two periods. It's just like, uh, it takes... It's very funny to me the way this has unfolded, Charlie, because you wrote that article a few weeks ago. Hey, they're learning to win without playing their absolute, like, A-plus yeah. game. And then literally everything felt like, I mean, not fell apart, but three guys on the blue line got hurt, and they traded a fourth. That's uh, two-thirds of the defensemen, you know. <laughs> they're down to just the one NHL-caliber goalie at this point, and who knows what's going on with him right now. It's, it just seems like, oh, we got to this, we built to this point where we, this is a good team. It's not just a team that's outworking everyone. It's not just a team that might be getting a little lucky. They're good. Yeah. And then suddenly, oh, so many things went wrong. Well, one thing that you have to, and we actually talked about this on the show, one thing you have to remember is that really I would say through up until the end of January, pretty much everything that could have gone right for this team went right. Mm hmm you had guys like Sean Walker dramatically exceeding expectations. You had players like Travis Sanheim, who last year 
barely look like a top four caliber NHL defenseman playing like a number one. You had Sam Harrison playing really well in a backup role. You had, you know, to that point, you still had Carter Hart, who that was very much a a source of, we don't know if we're going to have Carter Hart this year because who knows if he was involved in Hockey Canada or not. You know, through the middle of January, pretty much everything that could have went right for the Flyers went right. Then, honestly, really starting with Carter Hart, taking the indefinite leave of absence, then getting charged, it's, it's been more of dare I say it, like a normal flyer season in terms of, like, the way that <laughs> terrible, like, like, obviously yeah. it's not normal for your goalie to get charged, no, charged no, with sexual no, assault. No, no. However, it is normal, especially over the last few years, for every possible thing to go wrong for yeah. the flyers, because it's just something we've come to expect, where, oh, this good thing is, is here? Yeah, it's gone. And that's pretty <laughs> much the way it's been. Like, Sean Couturier, another example. Sean yeah. Couturier, for the first three and a half months, four months of the season, was basically playing like old Sean Couturier. That was far from a foregone conclusion. Like, that was not even close to being a lock. The guy had two back surgeries, is in his 30s, and missed a year and a half. The fact that he came back the first half of the year and pretty much looked like his old self, that was, was it possible? Sure. It didn't seem likely. No. No. And Again, what we've seen over these last maybe month, month and a half is more of maybe what we expect it this season to be. And if it would have happened from the start, it would have been like, oh, yeah, this is this is what we thought the Flyers were. It's the fact that we got three and a half months of what it feels like to be a team that, like, isn't just constantly getting stabbed by the hockey gods, <laughs> which is why this feels even more painful yeah. when now we're dealing with, like, the normal life of being a Flyers fan. Yeah, the normal the normal life of being... There ain't no normal life of being a Flyers fan. I'll tell you that. Uh, now, I, I will say, while Sean Couturier, his play may have fallen off over the last few uh, weeks, few months, what have you, one of the most impressive feats of his entire illustrious career last night, setting up a Nick Delorier goal. Actually, I, I Has he been this. credited with the yeah, assist yet? We need to. Still, it better yeah. have been. Let's see. I mean, it's still unassisted on um, on Yahoo, but sometimes they're late. Let me check to see if it's if it's still unassisted I mean, on the. Uh, the old NHL.com. I'll be writing a sternly worded letter <laughs> if he's not been given an assist. We really yeah, need to petition he, the league for this one. It is still an unassisted oh, goal by Nick Delorier. Like, is... come on, that goal does not happen if Sean Couturier doesn't do that work behind the net. No. He definitely touched the puck. Like, he definitely helped move that puck over to Delorier. Whether Absolutely. it bounced off someone or not, I'd have to go back and really look at the tape. But that is unfair if Sean Couturier doesn't get an assist on that play. Because, like, okay, it's already very difficult for Nick Delorier to score a goal. It's <laughs> Near impossible for him to get an unassisted goal. uh, No, that's honestly, I don't know. Sean Couturier deserves the assist. If he has, if Delorier, though, finishes the season with one goal and it's unassisted. That is very funny. In the box score, you look and go, (laughs) oh, so like he like blocked a shot and went on a breakaway or something? No, dangled his way down the ice. That was not the case. No, that was a great play, though, by Couturier. And it was honestly, like, we clown a little bit. It was really cool to see Delorier get a goal. Obviously, we want a guy to score a goal. And the thing is, too, is like, he's a guy where everybody on that bench knows that he doesn't score much. Nick Delorier knows he doesn't score much. He is, Nick Delorier is is very self-aware of the role he plays and his limitations as a player. He will openly talk about it. To see him score a goal, if that doesn't jack up no, everybody that, on the bench... I think it did. And I think it did. I mean, they, 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 they almost closed the gap and win the game. Yeah. Like, that had to just get everyone pumped. Like, if, if anyone on that bench was feeling sorry for themselves, you see Nick Delorier score his first goal of the season, and you're like, hey, why can't we win this game? I mean, the team leads the league in balls per 60. Yeah. And he's very much a part of that culture. Yeah. But no, that's... I truly do believe that was at least part of the catalyst oh, yeah. for them to for look... Sure. To look straight dead in the water, and then, oh wow, they could win this game. Yeah, like I very much believe that is yeah, one and, of those and, and incalculable to, things. And to be clear, Nick Delury is beloved in that room. Oh, I mean, everybody, of everybody he is. loves Nick. Dude, so to the see him score, are always the best dudes. They generally are always great dudes. Yeah, yeah. No, it's it's re- it was fun to see. You just wish they could have turned that into again. You just wish it could have gone a little different. If they lose forty seconds into overtime, yeah, it's like, yeah, well, yeah, they got a point. All yeah, right. yeah, here's, they're down five two. Here's the thing, though. Like, don't you guys think that like seeing that game last night, 
We've been looking at the stretch of games, and I think everyone's kind of just been mentally penciling in a bunch of L's, which is why we're like, oh, if you can steal a point, you got to steal it. They could do this again. Like, there's no That's reason true. why they can't do this against Toronto. There's no reason they can't do this against the Rangers. Like, this team has shown that despite the lack of talent and despite all of the things kind of going against them right now, they do have it in them to show up for these games against big teams and pull out wins that they never should have been able to get. Yeah. So if anything last night, while it was a disappointment, while you would have liked to see them, you know, complete the comeback or even more ideally not melt down at all um, during those third. three minutes. Yeah. yeah. I, I kind of come away from it feeling like, you know what? Maybe they can get a couple of points out of this stretch that we didn't think they were going to get at all. It's, it's a fair point. Like, it's not as if... I know we all have the Toronto game fresh in our minds because that just happened. That one stunk. They did take a point from Toronto in Toronto just last month. Mm -hmm. And they were already dealing with, like, Sealer was still there and Walker was still there. But they were already dealing with defense injuries. That was post-Drysdale and, and Risto being gone. That wasn't full-strength defense. They've beaten Carolina before this year. So they've done that. Mm -hmm. Boston is just, I mean, we talked about it last night. It just seems like that team just has the Flyers no, number yeah, right it's, now. It's funny, it really, at three, this point. Three, three, 13 and two now in the last 16. Jeez. Well, how the hell did they get to the three? <laughs> like, I, and, and, I, I don't, I don't though, know if the like, players feel that way, but I can tell you the fans certainly do. Where When Boston's on the schedule, you're like, oh, God, these, yeah, these freaking guys. The, but it is funny to be like uh, looking at the stretch and going, oh, man, this is. It was 10 days ago that they beat Florida. Yeah. yeah. It was 10 yeah. days ago. And, I mean, I guess following that up with that Tampa Bay game I is, mean, we don't have to talk about that one, like, though. That kind of... It did I take guess the wind two, out of everyone's sails. Those yeah. two kind of wash each other out there. Yeah. And then it's like, well, they, they had to beat the Sharks. That was like a must-win game on the schedule. And they did. Yeah. And since and they then, did. they've allowed 12 goals. Like, you know, and that's not great. How bad... Uh, I can't believe, I guess that's maybe the most surprising thing of this season thus far. We're, we're 68 games in. 68 games in, wow. How oh, so close to being nice. huge, <laughs> how huge Sean Walker and Nick Sealer were for this team. Yeah. Who knew? I mean, just like a I viable... Do. We a viable 20 minutes, every, like yeah. 17 to 20 minutes every night of NHL caliber play. They move the puck. They're good in their own. It, like, I can't believe how much worse off this team is without Sean Walker, who none of us had heard of prior to the Flyers acquiring him I mean, in the Proveroff trade, and Nick Sealer, who we were all like, yeah, I guess he's he a guy. Yeah. yeah, he's fine. Yeah, he's fine. I mean, and now it's like, oh, no, when he comes back, uh, that's like going to be a huge lift huge for this lift. team. There's yeah, a reason it, that Danny was able to get a first for Sean Walker. Yes. Like, it was pretty yeah, like, clear how important he was. The <laughs> list of guys who went for non-conditional first-round picks is like... Some stars and, and Sean, Sean Walker. Walker. Yeah. Well, it, it does speak to number one. It speaks to the Two state. Two goals last night, Sean yeah. Walker for the. Oh, he scored, I, I saw he scored one. I never realized he scored a second. Good for him. I'm glad he's fitting in Colorado. But it speaks to number one, the state of the defense core right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it also. To, to give some credit, it speaks to what Nick Sealer has turned himself into. Absolutely. That, that we are sitting here in the middle of March saying, oh, my God, they desperately need Nick Sealer back. Like, who would have thought that about Nick Sealer two years ago Not when me. he was joined at the hip to Keith Yandel? Like, oh, God. <laughs> uh, oh, man. That was his job oh, two years man. ago. He was no the, wonder he, we thought he stunk. Yeah, he was this he, good the whole time. Yeah, he was the sacrificial lamb that had to play next to Keith Yandel. the corpse of Keith Yandel. Oh, yeah, my God. That, you're all right. That is the year that I – nope. Doesn't, doesn't yeah. compute for me. Yeah. I do not think of the. Yeah. I it have no memory of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He. No wonder we didn't like him. Yeah. It wasn't oh his fault. God. He was Nick, just next I'm to a sorry. player that wasn't an NHL caliber player anymore. I'm sorry, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I was dead we wrong. We was wrong. <laughs> you were this good the whole time, probably. <laughs> I'm uh, proud of you. No, and I bet, like, you know, everyone loves Coots and he's been here forever. Right. Like, there's. Certain guys who you just know are going to be popular here. Uh, the ladies seem to love Jamie Drysdale. Um, Tippett scores. We like him. Yeah, and not he's you. Fun. He's not your type. He's a child. I mean, I'm. I could pro. I, I think technically I could be his mother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, like I bet Nick Sealer today 
is one of the more popular guys here. Yeah, I would like, think so. Like for the fans, like if you're well, looking for your, your autographs. Pick for who to get a Christmas present was? Oh, yeah. Because he's such a nice he's such, dude. A, such a nice guy. Yeah. He uh, seems like a nice guy. I would not be shocked to hear like, oh, the Nick Sealer line was full all day. <laughs> like that would not shock me. I would at this. actually love to see that kind of, I would actually love it. Like, you know, no disrespect to Travis Konechny, but it would kind of be cool as hell if, like, Nick Delorier's line was the longest line today. There's, there's going to be a lot of particularly older fans, I think, that want to talk to Nick Delorier because he's, oh, for sure. he's a throwback fighter type yes. player. So people over the age of 50 are going to gravitate towards Nick Delorier. <laughs> People or, under the age of 25 very well might gravitate towards Jamie Trice. <laughs> I, I gravitate towards Nick I was going to say, Bill and I aren't that old, Charlie. So, Goddamn 50, so. Charlie. Jesus. <laughs> no, uh, it's... You wish they could have, like, even just for a day like today, man, if they pull off that one. Like, I remember being at the... Uh, at a Phillies, their ALS thing. And it was, like, maybe the last one at the vet. Uh, Jim Tomei's first year, and like his line is insane. But the day before that, I think Todd Pratt hit a walk off against the Red Sox. Okay. <laughs> and so everyone that day was like, "Yo!" And, like Todd Pratt was the man <laughs> that like he happened to be the hero. Yeah. So he like he uh, like Nick Delorier at least he got his goal last night. People are gonna be like, "Dude, yeah. hell yeah!" Yeah. Like, nice, that's, nice and goal, that's really really cool. I know it yeah. is fun. But but going back a second because you talked about that we didn't expect that the Sealer Walker pairing would they would be this missed. By the numbers this year. They're their best. It yeah. was their best pairing. Like I did this and the numbers probably aren't completely up to date now because Sanheim and York have played together since this because I did this article. It did it, I believe, the uh, the Saturday after the, when they lost to the Capitals in Washington. I published it that Saturday. It was before Sean Walker was traded. It was while they were still, you know, we had the rumors that maybe they were going to resign him, that maybe they weren't getting the offers they wanted. So it was very much a, is he going to stay? Is he going to go type of article? Well, when I did that article, I looked up the stats for all three of the Flyers' primary pairings this year, which have been Sanheim York, your primary first pair, Sealer Walker, your primary second pair, and obviously this pairing isn't isn't applicable anymore because Ristolainen's out. But Zamul Ristolainen kind of was your your default third pair when everyone was healthy. So if you're looking at expected goals for the Sealer Walker pairing, by far had the best. They were at 56.4%. Then you had Zamola Rissalainen, which again, third pair getting the easiest minutes. Sheltered. They were at 51.1%, significantly lower than the second pair, which was getting tougher minutes. And then you had York Sandheim, which was at 49.1%. Like, not horrific, but certainly not to the point where they are taking apart the opposition. This was a Flyers team that, in terms of controlling play, was very much leaning on the minutes that Sealer and Walker were providing to control play and outshoot and outchance the opposition. Now now that pairing is completely gone. Walker is gone for good, presumably. Or is he? I mean, I guess it's possible they could sign him in the offseason. <laughs> you never know. You never but know. Sealer's still here, but he's gone for now, for however long it takes him to come back from this injury. So they are now functioning without, by far, their best defensive pairing this season. And this is kind of what you would expect to happen yeah. when a team loses its best pair entirely. They're going to struggle. And then you add in the teams they're playing and it doesn't do them any favors. It doesn't. Like, we're talking about the Leafs. Now, the Leafs aren't what they were. And you can probably say the same thing about Tampa Bay. They're not their best form of themselves of true, the last true. few years. No, they're not. But the Leafs are a goal-scoring machine. You have these top end. We've talked all year about the Flyers' biggest hole is just top end talent. Right. You put them up against these teams now, and they depleted four. It's like, what? how are they going to stop yeah. them? In what way yeah. can they possibly slow them down? And they simply have not been able to. They it, give it's, up it's, seven it's to Tampa, though, but again, six to Toronto, six to Boston. You did make the point that it's just 10 days ago that they beat yeah, Florida. Exactly. Yeah. It's less than a month ago that they beat Tampa by a 6-2 to two score. So, like... And this is something that Brad Shaw has said when we interviewed him during the Tortorella suspension. Tortorella hinted at this as well over the last couple of days. The Flyers are a team where if they play not even I, I wouldn't even quite characterize it as their best because like what is best? It's, it's, a, it's a nebulous concept. When they win, but they played their best, if, you know? Yeah, presumably. But <laughs> it's more like when they play their game. When they're, when they're playing their game without dramatic lapses, when they are forechecking, when they're attacking in transition, they're playing with speed, they're tight checking in the neutral zone, when they're playing the way that the coaches have, have coached them to play and they've shown they can play, 
it's not like they are a team that, oh, well, they can just beat the, the mediocre teams no. and they still, they still are out-talented by the best teams. They can make up the talent gap. They yes. can beat teams like Florida and Tampa and Carolina and Vancouver twice and Winnipeg. They've beaten these teams. It's just that they don't have a lot of margin for error. And what you saw last night was the embodiment of that, yes. where they played their game most of that game. Yeah. They had a lapse for three minutes, and that cost them the game. They cannot have those lapses, no. and the margin for error now is even smaller because of the injuries. Yeah, I think back to that. Like, earlier in the season, the, uh, the Vegas game they lost, and, like, they played great. Yeah. And it was just, like, the last few minutes Vegas just took over, and you went, yeah, this is the difference. If they just don't, if yeah. it's just a minute. Oh God, like, that was that was the night of the uh, the Phillies losing when they yes. when they lost. They finally lost in the playoffs in Game Seven because I remember coming back from the game and watching that game on television. And yeah, they they hung on. They they played right with the right with Vegas, and then it was like those final 10, 15 minutes of the third period. Vegas just turned on the afterburners, and they almost hung on for a point. Someone and then in the they chat scored mentioned that if you want to categorize the Flyers best, it was that. Dallas Stars win. Yeah. The win over the Stars. No, that, that was their best they game. They really kind of dismantled them. That was their best the game of the yeah. season. Yeah. They outshot them by a crazy degree. They had the puck the whole game. That was their best game they of the season. You just got to do that over and over again. I, I think the Florida game really is your yeah. blueprint. Like, yeah. that is the blueprint. A lot how, of block shots. Yeah, of how they have to win with mm -hmm. the defense core yeah. the way it is right now. Uh, real quick. Let's take a second to tell you about our friends at Bagels & Company. Hey it's Kelly Hinkle's favorite place for a bagel. Oh. First thing you have to know about Bagels & Company, huge bagels, the biggest Brooklyn-style bagels made right here with Philly Love, and a huge variety of them, usually 15 to 20 different types to choose from daily, anything from a regular, you know, everything bagel to maybe a Doritos bagel if you are so inclined. And when you have that many bagels to choose from, you need a ton of cream cheeses, 30 different flavors to choose from daily. And maybe the most important thing, an affordable brand. You get a lot of food for cheap. That's right. Who couldn't use that? And don't sleep on the coffee. It's not $7 for a cup of coffee. It's affordable, and it's freaking good. We have it at the office all the time. You all know I love my caffeine. I need it in my system, <laughs> usually 24-7. <laughs> bagels and Company, they hook it up. Try that coffee. For the best Brooklyn-style bagels made right here in Philly, head to thebagelsandco.com slash store dash locator to find the Bagels and Company near you. All right, so that's... Uh, that's kind of where we are with this team right now. With a month left looking at this schedule, how optimistic are we that they're going to get in? Yo, they're getting in. Like, I'm 100% optimistic that they're getting in. Don't look at that schedule. I don't need to see it. I'm telling you right now that, first of all, we have the fact that I, I do think that they're going to have some really good games down the stretch after we get over this little hump. I think they'll probably steal a game of these next couple against one of these teams. And then you have the fact that the stupid Islanders and the stupid Red Wings continue to do us favors by also not winning all of the games that they should win. So, like, the Flyers did themselves a lot of favors at the start of the season, banking some points, getting ahead of the pack. And I really do think, like, barring some kind of app, like, if Sam Harrison has just, like, forgotten how to be a goaltender, like, okay, maybe they'll just, like, lose out or something and they won't get in. But, like, I – if they're not in the play – like, I'm le legitimately going to be surprised. I really think they're going to make it. You look at the teams that are chasing them. Okay, like, I think we can all agree that Tampa is going to make the playoffs. Tampa's going to get 100%. Like, they're yes. technically in that mix, but it's really hard to envision a world where the Tampa Bay Lightning yeah. do not make the playoffs. So you're really looking at four teams here. I'm going to remove Buffalo from the equation because I think they were barely in the equation. It basically became like, well, I guess if they just keep winning, maybe they'll be in it. Then they lost, and now you remember, oh, they're Buffalo. Yeah, they're not. They're they not beat there. the Islanders, and they had more games played than everyone. So it was like, oh, they won a four-point game, and now they're kind of – but, yeah, they're not really. But you've – so you've basically got the Flyers, the Red Wings, the Capitals, and the Islanders. Okay. 
So the Islanders were the team that was scaring people. Now the Islanders have lost three straight. So the Islanders have crashed back to earth. The Capitals suddenly are the team that's now, yeah. oh, man, the Capitals are coming. You know, wor worry about them because they, they beat Vancouver last night, obviously a really good team. They beat Seattle two nights ago or three nights ago now, I guess. But before then, I mean, they got blown out by the Oilers 7-2. to They have a negative 30 goal differential. I just don't look at them as a team, and they don't have an easy schedule the rest of the way. Like, I guess they beat Vancouver, so they show they could beat teams, but Calgary's okay. Toronto, they get Toronto next. Then Carolina. Then Winnipeg, who beat them 3 nothing two weeks ago. Detroit is whatever. Then they get Toronto again. Then they get Boston. Like, they don't have an easy schedule either. So... I just feel like if the Flyers, they just need to squeeze a couple points out of yeah. these few games. And if they can do that, then when the schedule turns, if they just take care of business against the Montreals, you know, against the Chicagos, against those, against the Columbuses, the teams that they really should beat. And say what you will about that Sharks game, they took care of business against the team that they should beat. They had they, to win and did. If they can just do that. I just don't look at any of those other three teams yep. in Detroit, the Islanders, and the Capitals. And... I don't look at them. They don't scare me. No. I guess it's hockey. Teams can go on runs, unpredictable runs, whatever. You never know. But none of those teams make me think for a fact that, like, oh, man. Like, it would be one thing if it was the Devils two points behind the Flyers. And I'd be like, oh, shit. They're they're they're. There's coming. a team with some high ends. Yeah, that scares me. Like, those teams, as I feel like I'm with Kelly. As long as the Flyers don't just like go on a seven eight game losing streak yes. i think they should still be able to pull this off i guess i'm just i am a little worried about what we're going to get out of sam Harrison the rest of the way i'm not and if this defense in front of him isn't even i'm not even okay yeah they, they miss sean walker like sure like if they can't get risto and jamie drysdale back like who the hell is going to be playing for this team? Well, it's we, just... we know who's going to be playing. It's the guys we've been watching. Exactly. <laughs> and they've given up like six or seven goals in three of the last four games. So that's that becomes... Oh, and uh, now, oh, outstanding. Are on? Yes, we yes. are. Oh, you're, you're fine. Sit. Sit. Yep. Sit. How are you doing? How are you doing? So oh, we very have... Well, very well. I was... Joining the podcast, we have one Dan Hilferty, the chairman and CEO of Comcast Spectacor. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Charlie, thanks. It's a, it's an honor to be with you. Uh, you and I run into each other a lot. <laughs> we do. Uh, we do. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, you know, I was, no. <laughs> Don't get me in trouble. <laughs> so, uh, so, Dan, I wanted to kick things off uh, with a question about the trade deadline because I was obviously on the trip. We ran into each other quite a few times on that trip, mm -hmm. you know, around the locker room and stuff after practices and whatnot. And you briefly mentioned to me about, you know, being able to be part of the trade deadline and about, you know, being able to be in the room and watching, you know, the hockey men do their work. Right. What was that like? And what did you learn from watching, you know, Danny Briere and Keith Jones and the scouts and the analytics guys, everybody making those decisions in real time? Well, Charlie, I, I think from the very beginning of my role as, as chair and, and CEO of Comcast Spectacor and governor for the Flyers, I've been very clear that I'm a hockey fan. I'm by no means a hockey expert. And so the, the fun of this first year, full year in the role is that not only having the opportunity to hang out with Keith Jones and Danny Brer on a regular basis, uh, I learn from them every game. I knew something new about the sport, something new about strategy. And so to be in the room while they were making key decisions about the future of our franchise was really exciting to me. And I just had nothing to say. I just listened. And to your point, it was a perfect Danny's in charge in that room, and Jonesy is the guy that, that kind of keeps in touch with everybody around the room, and those two are in constant contact. They almost don't have to talk to each other. They just get each other. Scouts all, all were heard. Uh, there was healthy debate around different decisions that were being made. And then the analytics piece, not only in terms of understanding the players that might become part of the family or players who might leave the Flyers family, it was also about how do we fit it into the salary cap? How do we make it work for that, not only the short term, but the long term? And I, I left just really feeling very positive about uh, Danny's command of the room, 
uh, Jonesy's in a different way command of the room, the teamwork between them, and the collegial atmosphere and trusting atmosphere where a scout could disagree and there would be really positive conversation about it. Love that. That's that's really great to hear the uh, just the cohesiveness of the decision making process. Uh, now I think everyone outside the organization. I know I have very pleasantly surprised by the way things have gone this season. But for you in like the it's kind of starting out now officially, the chairman and uh, CEO of Comcast Spectacor, like what's the, been the biggest surprise to you? Is it this season? Is it something behind the scenes? What has been like the biggest shock? Well, as a fan, the, the season has been the biggest surprise because I, uh, you know, the, the guys ranging from Torts to Danny to Jonesy were very clear that we are in a rebuilding mode. Uh, the players had a different feeling about that. And what, what I love about the three of them and their hockey leadership is that they allowed the players to take us where they wanted to go. And then as we got closer to trade deadline, yes, we, we did what we needed to do around more draft picks, really strategically thinking 24, 25, and beyond. But also we tried to give this great group of individuals who are a, an amazing team of people a chance to maximize their potential. So for me, the greatest joy was watching the three hockey leaders interact with this locker room. I've never seen a locker room like this in my life. Any sport, teams I've been on, teams I've observed, it, it's real, it's real. These guys care about each other and to see that brain trust give them a chance to maximize their potential is my, great, is my greatest uh, thrill of the season. So in terms of, you know, other thrills, I know the, the first time that, that we met in person was actually at last year's carnival. Right, was, around, right around the yeah, bend there. Right, yeah. right around the bend, exactly. I'm sure that first carnival, that was, you know, right after the organizational changes, you were still, you know, kind of integrating yourself into the Flyers organization. How different does this carnival feel to, to that one? Well, well, for me, I know my way around. I, 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 know, I know you. I know, I know more people this year. Um, I just I feel part of the family, and not not that I didn't then, but I was I was a new kid on the block, and any new kid has to prove that they belong. <laughs> I hope I have, but but so for me it just feels um, that I am uh, when you when you take the business and the hockey side and combine them, I'm an integral part of that. And and like I said, I will never make a hockey decision. I will support our efforts, whatever they might be. Uh, but I feel a key part of it, and I feel part of the 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 four. Torts, Danny, Jonesy, and myself. We all talk about pulling the rope in the same direction, and I feel a key part of that. So just keeping with the carnival a little bit. So yes. as a fan, I've noticed that the organization has kind of taken a the approach of bringing back some of the older school stuff that used to be a part of, like, game presentation, the experience of being a Flyers fan. It's, it's noticed. Yeah. And I think with the carnival today, something that I've noticed is it seems like you've brought back the players being kind of more of an approachable part of the carnival. I think the Phantoms are here this yep. year, right? Which is great. Um, that's something that as someone who used to go to the carnival every year, that was one of my favorite parts, is being able to interact with the players that you like so much, play these games with them. It's so fun. Um, was that a conscious choice by the organization to kind of get the players a little bit more closer to the fans this year at the carnival? Well, Kelly, yes. And if you go back to kind of the unfolding of this new regime, which I was part of that unfolding, we talked about, there, there had been some criticism about the past, and, and what I felt was, when you're talking about our, the, I call them the foundational titans of our franchise, whether it be Bobby Clark, uh, Paul Holmgren, uh, Billy Barber, and so many others, many of whom are over signing autographs as we speak, yeah. um, really wanted to make sure that the fan base knew that we were moving in a new direction in the sense of, Danny and Keith really focused on analytics. Torts being focused on the what's he called the eye, uh, the, the eye, eye test. test. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, it's been a conscious decision. Yeah. And as it relates to Flyers charities, for me, it all starts with the men and women who make up our players, our coaches, and their families, their yeah. spouses. It, it if people aren't willing to be approachable, no matter what you do. They have, they have jumped in with both feet. They have, they have led us to this point where they want to be accessible. They want to be part of the community. And what I've learned across the board, 
these are real people. Yeah. They're, they're just real genuine people. So it's easy to open the doors, so to speak, and allow them to engage with the fan base, a fan base who admires them so much yeah. and also admires the great tradition of Flyers hockey. Absolutely. Great. Um, so, Dan, thanks so much for, for joining us. I'm going to put you a little bit on the spot here for the uh -oh. last question. Yeah, I knew this was coming. <laughs> uh, so the Flyers obviously are still sitting in a playoff spot. The schedule's tough. They've had some tough losses this past week. Do you think the Flyers make the playoffs in the end? Charlie, I guess, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a politician here. <laughs> here. Here's what I think. As a fan, I am so hopeful, and I couldn't sleep after last night's game, but I was so encouraged by that yes. flurry of activity at yes. the end. So I will say this. They have a fighting chance to make the playoffs, but I want to hang my, my hat on what Torts said to everybody in Boston before the game yesterday. The fact that we are playing meaningful games well into March, the fact that these young players and these seasoned professionals are getting a chance to play meaningful games, I think we're going to rise to the occasion. I don't know if rising to the occasion means making the playoffs, but I'll tell you what, regardless, it sets us up for a bright and exciting future. How's that for a political answer? That, that, is, a, that, that is spoken like a true CEO of a major company. What I heard was the Flyers are 100% making the playoffs. That's well, what I heard. I'm glad That's you heard that. I'm glad you heard that. So that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. How ridiculous is it, just before you get out of it, how ridiculous is it working with Jonesy every day? Uh, I just, so here, here's the thing, I, and I, I am going to be blunt about this. When I first accepted this role, um, I knew I wanted him to be president, and I knew Danny was going to be the, the full-time uh, GM. Uh, I, and I hadn't met Jonesy. I just know of him. We had a secret meeting uh, down in Florida when they played at Tampa Bay, and then we went through a process. He stood out abo above the crowd. And so every day, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. And I feel like... Uh, older brother might be too strong, but with the two, those two guys, I just I, I, I'm That's happy awesome. to give them my business sense. While I marvel, I marvel at their expertise in, in their profession. Dan, this has been yeah. excellent. Thank thanks you so, so much. Yeah. Thanks, 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 thanks so you. much, Dan. We will Charlie? not keep you from uh, from more of your carnival uh, no, activities. Let's talk for, come on, let's go another half hour. Here. I'm guessing <laughs> you're going to go play cornhole with Sam Harrison now. Yeah, let's go play yeah, some cornhole. Yeah, <laughs> oh, this is incredible. They're right behind the right, Love it. See you guys. Thank, right, thank, thank you, so, you much. so much. That's uh, Comcast Spectacore CEO and Chairman. Dan Helferty joining us here at the Flyers Charities Carnival. This is the 45th Flyers Charities Carnival, and you can just see whether you're uh, just a lifelong hockey fan like Dan or someone who's been involved in the organization longer, like Jonesy we'll talk to in a bit. Uh, like, this does mean a lot to them this day. Yeah. Like, this is yeah. an important day on the schedule, as big as, like, any game. And I think it's very genuine how much they want to reach out to the fans, especially after the last few years where whether it's yeah, access was just not what it could be because of COVID yeah. or then uh, the relationship between the team and the fans kind of plummeting over the last <laughs> few years. Like, it coming back, like, you can tell everyone's – there's a buzz in here. The vibes are strong, as Hinkle so would say. Good. The vibes are so good. That so, was nice. That was so, fun. So I love that dude. That's, he's great. He's fucking great. They are so good. Like, we all know – what the game is you know we've been doing this oh yeah but they're all so good at it i believe what they say <laughs> like even though i like i know he's like he just said i'm gonna be a politician yeah, yeah. i believe every word he said every single one <laughs> no i i, I think that I don't you think know he's i've made this <laughs> point i've made this point on twitter multiple times i've made this point on the show that sometimes i use the word pandering and people take that to mean I'm being critical. No. I think pandering, pandering is good. Is good. Pandering, I want to be pandered pandering to. Pandering is a to good me. thing. Please. Be because pandering shows that you care enough to pander. Yeah. Like, not everything has to be like, oh my god, I am so ultra sincere. I'm just doing this purely out of the kindness of my heart. You no know what? No one is that way. No one is that way. <laughs> not only do you care enough to pander, but you understand what the way people to do it. want. Yeah. Like, you yeah. understand what fans want from you enough to know how to pander effectively. That's, uh, and that's had, a big deal. We yeah. had this exchange on Twitter uh, about the pandering, yeah. and I was like, 
when I when the last Ghostbusters movie came out, and I was like, I love it. My buddy was like, it's a little too much fan service. No. Like, I've been waiting 30 years. <laughs> I want to be service. Service. I deserve to be pandered to. Pandered to I, me. I, and that's they seem to be they seem to be nailing that. Uh, yes. Before before we go uh, any further, let's talk about the best place for your flooring. It's Empire Today. With Empire Today, you get shop at home convenience, the right product for your needs, quick and professional installation, and a price match guarantee. Empire Today is the best place to get new flooring. So of course, they've got copycats, but the copycats can't beat Empire Today on quality, service, speed. So what do they do? They advertise low quality products that Empire simply won't carry. Empire Today won't promise the lowest prices because anyone who does that is putting flooring in your home that they wouldn't put in their own. The Empire philosophy is to help you find what you need, not overwhelm you with thousands of choices and substitutes. What they leave out of their selection is as important what they put in. Empire's product team exhaustively combs through thousands of product samples each year to find the perfect styles. Our and the virtual floor designer is a great way to see how new floors will look in any space. It's easy, just snap a picture and instantly see how new floors will look in your room. Schedule a free in-home estimate today. All listeners can receive a $350 off discount when they use promo code PHLY. Restrictions apply. See empiretoday.com slash PHLY for details. 1-800-588-2300. Empire. Today. Oh, see. It's... Guys, <laughs> I have some really bad news. Oh, wow. No. Are we not? Did the show tank? What happened? Sam Harrison stinks at cornhole. Is he bad? He's real bad. I mean, that he, just makes him more relatable, though. He missed the board. That Several makes it more relatable. I mean, yeah. You know what? It's kind of maybe. like the opposite of goaltending when you think about it. That's true, yeah. So maybe he doesn't need to be good. Well, at like, who is who is the I'm player? Worried, like, if if someone misses, I want to see him stop it though. Yeah, just get him. <laughs> like, block the hole. Don't let these kids no, uh, score. That, I, I just looked behind us and realized like they're there. Yeah. I, I didn't yeah. see the players show up earlier. Yeah, yeah. I, hopefully what a cool, too, like, too what a cool experience. Nice like, fucking if rules, I was a dude. kid, if I was a kid, I'd be going nuts at this. Oh yeah, Bill. I, I, <laughs> hard for me to be sitting here at this table <laughs> knowing that I could be playing cornhole with Sam Harrison, but instead I'm doing this. I am geeking out. Like, I'm never going to not be excited about this kind of stuff. And the players just, like, being around, playing the games, like, it's just, it's fucking cool. It's so cool for fans to be able to come and do this. It it's definitely is. And, and speaking to your comment about Sam Harrison not being the best at cornhole, I'm going back to a classic quote from one Pat Maroon when he said... <laughs> I play hockey, not school. <laughs> Sam Harrison plays goalie, not cornhole. That's right. Uh, I wanted to. Uh, there's, the there's, there's big uh, like beer pong somewhere. I think it just. I think it just pong, uh, but pong, just pong, I no want, beer. I want a Flyers play. Like they need to double. They need to get the, the double rest. casts on somebody. <laughs> oh, for the the ultimate. Yes. It's one of the all-time great I mean, photographs in Flyers history. Seriously. Just say Claude Giroux doesn't play through injury. Put it on the wall, like upstairs <laughs> on the club Deep level. Up. I'm shooting. <laughs> <laughs> So what we're referring to for people who don't know yeah, is... for people who aren't so, our age. So back, <laughs> totally so 10 years ago. <laughs> back in the, the early days of Claude Giroux, this was even before he was captain, I think. Well, I before. think this was after the 2012 playoffs. Right, because he had to get double surgeries on his wrist yes. because Sidney Crosby slashed she the hell out playoffs, of him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's on face on face said, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a picture that summer of Claude Giroux playing beer pong because he was, what, like 23 years old? He 24? was a small child. He's, yeah, yes. college so he's kid, doing basically. what we all did when we were in our early 20s, which is playing <laughs> stupid drinking games. And the video was or the picture was of him like holding a ping pong ball in mid shot and both of his wrists were wrapped because he was playing after he got the <laughs> surgeries and it just shows the dedication to the game you know that he's willing to play through injury to help his team win a key yep. game of beer pong. Listen, you got to you got to do what you got to do. Exactly. And it's it's really it's just cool to see that uh, I think we're going to be getting Jonesy in just a minute. He's I a think, man of the people. He's chatting saw, with the people. Yeah, it's, there's no uh, there's no, he doesn't go anywhere. He's like there's nowhere he can just walk through. He's like a celebrity in an airport. It's just like he's got to shake hands with everybody yeah. on the way here. Uh, and that's that's Keith Jones. What's is he he's doing? He's the president, baby. <laughs> he is. He's he, making his way slowly but surely. Right. Right. <laughs> he was behind me, and now he is. And I <laughs> figured he was like hands. doing something ridiculous behind me. He's coming to like see. give you bunny ears on the camera. I mean, he probably would do that. Yeah, that would yeah. be that would be a very yeah. Jonesy thing to do. Oh, but uh, what uh, the thing I'm excited to talk to him about is just like 
the idea of what success is for this team because we're like I've been critical over like I just uh, the losses are hurt, but it feels like it's already kind of been uh, like maybe a success. And speaking of success stories, here we go. It is the, the Flyers president of hockey operations. There he is. The president the, is here. What a man only, of the Keith hour. Jones. The, uh, the president has made it. He shook hands with everyone in the building on the way up. <laughs> Not everybody. I'm still working on it. How are you guys Slowly doing? Very well. How yeah. are you this morning, Jones? Doing great. Doing great. Nice to see everybody. Thanks so much for uh, for taking some time to come on yeah. the PHLY Flyer Show. We, we appreciate you guys being here and uh, being around this year, too. It's been nice. Any outlet we can have that's talking Flyers hockey, we're happy about it and uh, appreciate all the hard work you guys are putting in. Well, we certainly appreciate the uh, the hard work you guys are putting in as well. On You're the making team. it a lot easier for yeah. us, by <laughs> well, it's bumpy right now, but we're trying. There's no doubt. Uh, last night was a little bit uh, more of the way that I think our guys have battled for much of the year. Good to see the fight yes. back in there, some energy back, and hopefully that builds, you know, during this really important week. So we uh, we just a few minutes ago talked to uh, to Dan Hilferty. He was here. Um, obviously, I, I ran into Dan a couple times on the road trip down in uh, down in Florida, uh, which overlapped with the trade deadline. Yep. And one thing that Dan had mentioned to me on that trip, and we got a little bit more information from him on the trip uh, about, was just the aspect of the trade deadline, everyone being in a room, everyone in the organization talking about the decisions that were made. Obviously, the big decision was the trade of Sean Walker. You guys also picked up Eric Johnson as well, made that player for player swap swap with Wade Allison and Dennis Gurionov. But what I'm curious, uh, Jonesy, is how difficult was it to make the decision to uh, to, to trade Sean Walker, which was very much a future-focused move, even with the team in a playoff spot and, and battling to uh, to make the first playoff uh, playoff run since 2019-2020. Uh, yeah, it was a balancing act. There's there's no question. There's a, a lot of thought that went into it. Uh, we probably would have traded Sean earlier if we weren't in the f- position that we were. Mm. Uh, there was opportunities to do that. Um, he was such an important part for our club. He did an outstanding job. He's a very good player. I think he scored twice last night he for did. Colorado. Um, and we had lots of discussions with a lot of different teams about him. So it it was a, it was hard. There's no question that he was a big part of our locker room and our on ice product. So in recognizing that Sealer was hurt at the time, we knew we were you know missing you know really two thirds of our defensive core that we're going to have some rocky moments right now and then we're asking our young goaltenders an awful lot to you know try to steal steal some games against some high quality opponents with a diminished blue line so yeah there was a lot of thought that was put into it but ultimately uh, the, the decision was easy because this year is about building and we're about the future and you know it's, it's a complex situation to try to pull this thing off, but I think we've got some really good hockey people involved, and we're using everything that we have at our disposal. Uh, we're lucky. We're, we're lucky that we can, uh, you know, rely on a lot of different people to come up with some really good decisions. Yeah. There's uh, there's about a month left in the season, Jonesy. You've gone through the troubles. You've mentioned the blue line injuries, everything that's happened with the team in the last few weeks, the schedule you're in. But you're still holding a playoff spot. You've seen some young players grow this year. You added the first round pick. You're playing meaningful games. A month from now, what will determine what made this year successful? Is it already? Like, what is success for the team this season? Yeah, I wouldn't say it is already. I I do think there's been some bright spots. Um, I think our younger players' development has been really sound. And I think that's something that we really wanted and we really appreciate from them. Uh, last night was a great example. Farabee scoring two goals and the 21 on the season. That's a very impressive year for him after the injury issue that he dealt with last season. Uh, Forrester continues to develop. Uh, Tippett with three assists last night. Frost with a really strong game and an incredible goal last night. Uh, Zamula continues to impress on the back end. And York has been a standout all season long. It's he has been an extremely impressive player for us and a big part of our future as well. Um, so those are the, the type of things that excite me. Uh, we know we still have to continue to find pieces to fit this puzzle together, but there are some bright spots. And uh, from those 
from that standpoint, it's very encouraging. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited to, with what we've accomplished so far, which is nothing. And uh, <laughs> excited to see what happens here with some really challenging opponents. Uh, I'm a big believer in the spirit of our team, and I think our guys are going to rally around one another and find a way to, to win some important games here down the stretch. How important do you think it is for the, the long-term development of the team, you know, where you guys want to get to, of the fact that you guys are now playing in a couple of guys, Tortorella said this, you were playing in meaningful games right now. Like, do you, in your mind, do you learn things about the individual players that you wouldn't necessarily learn in November or December in these kinds of games? Yeah, you can see some things. There's, there's no question. I don't think you want to overanalyze it in some regard, just with some younger players, because everyone's got a little bit of a different development, developmental path. Um, but you're analyzing it for sure, and you're looking at it, and you're trying to you know, figure out uh, exactly where that player projects to be when you're going to be a very good team. Uh, and there's a lot of guys that are showing signs that they're going to be a big part of this in the future. So you are analyzing it closely. Um, these games are really cool in that regard. You know, they're nerve wracking at the same time. And on paper, sometimes we don't match up the same way against the opponent right now. But in the future, I think that we will. And it also gives us the opportunity to weigh our, you know, future stars uh, against some of the superstars in the league today and uh, th those guys have held their own this year uh, but we have a ways to go and we need to add some talent in, into the mix to make sure that we get there jonesy it's the uh, 45th flyers charities carnival Th you've been around this organization for years what does this day mean like on the schedule for the whole for everyone involved so the way i look at it was the first time i came here i, I played in two previous nhl cities washington and colorado and then we had charitable events that were fun a dinner or you know a bunch of people paid to come and visit with the players and such in washington and colorado was another huge dinner that was held within the arena and it raised a lot of money it was great and then I came here and I kind of wondered, what's this thing all about? And I showed up here and I was like, wow, this is like incredible. These fans, like a lot of the fans that you never get to interact with. And for them, they never get the opportunity to actually say hello and, you know, give you their regards. Uh, it was great. And it's just continued to be that, which is even more impressive, especially getting through the pandemic. And now having all these fans back in here today uh, really makes you feel great. And as a player, it's perspective. It's, you know, recognizing that there's a whole other world out there and we have to continue to give back. Uh, I think you have to be mindful of that. And it gives you a chance to just think about some things that are more important than the game. But at the same time, realize how important the game is to the fans that are coming out to watch you play. So I think it's a great thing. Um, I'm happy that we raised a lot of money and I'm really impressed that it's continued for as long as it has. There's been a lot this year, rightfully, spoken about you know the strength of, of the team, the team culture, the, the locker room, how tight the group is, and how important that is to the success of the team this season. Speaking to the carnival, you just mentioned about you know guys keeping things in perspective and giving back. It's obviously important for the team to, to like each other, to be tight, to have accountability, but how important is it, not just now, but in the future, you know, for you guys to go out and get players and keep players who who buy into the importance of events like this and in the importance of, of interacting and engaging with fans. I think it says a lot about the character of the player, how they react to come into something like this and how they show how much it means to them. I do think it's something to watch. Uh, I do think the players and how they interact within our community is really important. Uh, is it everything? Probably not. Um, but it's something that should be considered in when you're adding players to the mix. Like Garnet Hathaway is a great example. Uh, great. We knew all the things he did before in Washington and followed him closely. Um, I had a lot of friends in Washington that knew him well and in Boston where he made a great impression in a short period of time. Those are the type of people that really hold a team together, hold a team accountable and hold themselves accountable. And that, that, those type of qualities are what you want in your players. It's not in every player. Uh, but it can come out in other players when they're surrounded by players that have it. So I think that's uh, a really important ingredient, and we'll continue to, to look to add players like that, but at the same time mix in some highly talented players that may need a supporting cast to bring everything out of them in the, in the future. 
It's, uh, it's great that you were able to join us today, Keith. Thank you so much for stopping by. Good to see it's you guys, too. Always fun talking to you. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. I'm glad you guys are here. You're doing you. a great job. Thank and you. Thank you for having us. Take that care. Is Flyers, so much, President Thanks, of Keith. Hockey Operations, Keith Jones, stopping by here at the uh, Chill Zone at the Flyers Charities Carnival. And uh, before we go any further, I tell you about them. They're our presenting sponsor for every single show. It's our friends at Mortgage CS. Uh, listen, the spring purchase market, it's here. It's heating up quickly. Many clients, especially first-time home buyers, they're reaching out, and they want to be ready when rates drop. This is what everyone's doing. You know what that means? It means there's going to be limited inventory and strong demand, so competition for homes will remain fierce throughout the year. So you need to get in touch with Mortgage CS to prepare and ensure you will be able to stand out and make the strongest offer possible when the time is right for you. Whether you're a first time home buyer or you're looking to refinance, or you just want to know what you have to do to qualify for a mortgage when the time is right, Mortgage CS should be a consideration no matter your situation because Mortgage CS is made up of honest, good people and always work hard not to let their clients down. But don't take it from me. Check out their reviews on Google. They average five stars. Let's take a look at one of their most recent reviews from just a week ago. We had a great experience working with Ben, Alex, Shannon, and Christine. They answered every question we had. We're always prompt and friendly. Thank you so much. I mean, it's sure it's simple, but what else could you ask for? This is what we've been telling you about Mortgage CS all season. So when you hear the word mortgage, think of Mortgage CS. Think of Ben and Alec. Save Ben's phone number, 267-391-7425, or email him, ben at mortgagecs.com. Call or text anytime, day or night, email. And if you're not in the housing market, I bet you if you talk some Philly sports with him, he'll answer. Check out mortgagecs.com slash phly to get started today. This advertisement is not a commitment to lend or extend credit. Mortgage CS is an equal housing opportunity mortgage broker. All loans are subject to credit approval. Certain restrictions may apply. Company NMLS ID number 1464766. Visit MortgageCS.com for more information. Oh, all right. All right. Well, Jonesy, he said uh, that was that was good stuff there. Not quite sure they're successful yet. And now we are joined. This is This is a really special one. We Kelly, have nice Lou Nolan joining us. How are you today, Good, Mr. Well. Nolan? Yes, this is this is awesome. Yeah, the uh, Lou. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for uh, yeah. for joining us coming oh, on the show. Thanks for asking me. I'm glad to come on. Yeah, yeah. Everybody good? Oh, outstanding, outstanding. Doing we're having, great. We're having a good time out there, and uh, people are flooding in. And Great the, everything is crowded, which is good. <laughs> that is that That's is awesome. That's great to hear. After we finish our, uh, our our live show, I'm very excited to take a loop around the uh, around the arena and, and see how it all uh, how it all looks set up and, and filled in with all the fans. Yeah, the goalies are from the uh, uh, you know the group veterans group, uh, the Warriors, and uh, so I went down that way to, to see who was in net, and I'm not sure who was shooting it, but a ping. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> You know, usually it's these little kids that can barely beat it through, but somebody was putting it up near the goalie's eyeballs. So uh, <laughs> then they were going to go low after yeah, that. Then you got to go it. low. <laughs> love that. Yeah. So, so Lou, I guess to to kick things off, um, obviously the Flyers Charities Carnival has been an institution here. You know, with regards to the Flyers community for years, you've been part of it pretty much from the start. Yes. Uh, in terms of of what it's become over this past year. You know this particular carnival. There's been a lot of talk about how the organization is kind of you know rediscovering its old soul and and, and getting back as a new era of orange. Do you feel that today? So does it does it feel like this is you know almost like a uh, you know bringing it back to the way it used to be? Yes, it does, Charlie. And uh, I think it comes from the fact that that the the clients that come in here, the fans uh, are more excited. Yeah. Uh, you know, and uh, and happier. Uh, and uh, really getting involved a lot more. It, it, it's all about the people, you know. And uh, you do okay and you put a competitive team out there. And uh, under the, you know, the leadership of Dan Hilferty, you know, Dan's been great. And uh, Jonesy, everybody was surprised when Jonesy was named Director of Hockey Operations. And we all thought that Danny was probably going to be the general manager. Mm -hmm. Because he had learned up in Maine, and he, you know, he went through the process of learning all the departments and so forth. But uh, you know, Jonesy was a little bit of a surprise. The people d didn't give Jonesy uh, the credit he should get, because you know they knew Jonesy from IP in the morning, 
where, uh, you know, with that group there, <laughs> you know, they, they're crazy. And uh, he, was, he was crazy, too, with his, such, such a quick wit. Yes. And, uh, you know, he, but he has a very serious side when he has to. And uh, he's doing a great job here, too. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about this group, as excited as I've ever been. And, uh, you know, thinking about the old days with Ed and where Ed used to be, you know, right in the middle of it, Ed Snyder, and uh, be running the wheel and all this stuff like that. Dan was out there this morning riding the first wheel on the first ride with his, <laughs> his grandson and his daughter. That's awesome. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, so uh, all good. All good from the beginning. That's the uh, the excitement level here today. There just seems to be a good buzz. But yeah. it feels like the buzz is coming back to the building on game nights. And you have such a unique perspective getting to uh, getting to be part of it really every night, being the voice to the fans as the PA announcer. Are you starting to feel the excitement coming back? Is there a difference between this year and the previous few? You bet. Yeah. It sure is. It, uh, uh, I'm glad you noticed it, and I think others have too, that have been around the game and been around this building. Um, this is a pretty decent team. You know, there are a bunch of young kids coached by a sharp guy. And uh, what Tortorella has done is basically bought in all the players that they'll go through the walls for him. You know, uh, and... Um, he does a good job, as do his assistants. All the talent might not be there. You know, you go in and you play a, a team that's hyped up uh, in, uh, in Tampa. You know, and you go in there and you boom, 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 boom. You know, next thing you know, what am I doing? And you're behind by four zip. It, it's tough to come back. But you saw last night, if you watched. Yep. Uh, they had an opportunity to, uh, to grind two periods. And the key was, is it going to happen again in the third and you wait for an opportunity? Yeah. And uh, they didn't get the chance. You know, you got defensemen that uh, haven't played together very long. Uh, some are very young. Uh, and uh, they're all running around. And one guy falls over and loses a stick. And next thing you know, there's a goal. And then there's a goal eight, nine seconds later. And you say, wow. But, but these guys come back. You know, there's a timeout, which is important. And uh, I noticed the coach I'm watching as everybody else is on TV, he didn't say a word. Yeah. No, Speech. it was great. Not a single word. And <laughs> Terrifying. He, yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it was just a situation where uh, the guys finally started getting up on the bench and the leaders doing a little talking and so forth. And, you know, you get the next goal, and then they get one, and you get one, and then you're down two. And I think that um, uh, the goal you would wish he had that last yeah. one back. Yeah. Uh, there was enough time to see it. He just didn't get it. You know, uh, I tell my wife, you know, she watches and says, I don't understand why he didn't make that save. I said, well, you know, the puck's going 90, 100 miles an <laughs> yeah. hour, and he's 20 feet in front of you, and, and the net's so big, and it's either going to hit you, hit the pipe, or you make a spectacular save. And uh, sometimes it doesn't, especially up high, because goalies now all tend to go down. Yeah. You know, uh, they take that uh, Patrick Waugh kind of stuff to, yep. to, yeah. to heart. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I, I was proud of them, you know, and uh, yes. uh, I didn't give up. I never give up on them, and there were some big goals there, some big goals, some big opportunities. Uh, Morgan Frost, who has come out and been a um, uh, a real pleasure to watch. He's a nice kid, really that is. That goal last night was something else. Yeah, yeah. over around it, between the legs, <laughs> between during the a legs. game, during yeah. a game. Between the legs, through the five hole. Yeah. That was insane. It was, it was insane, yeah. I don't know, nuts. But, uh, you know, uh, I, I met him when he was just a rookie. And the reason I did, I, I made it a point to say little because his father was a Toronto Maple mm. Leafs PA guy. Yeah. And eventually, for Father's Night down here, I met him and we bonded. And he's become a, a great friend. Oh, I love that. And uh, I'm usually at the door when they come out for warm-up. It's just a ritual I've had for years. And, you know, you get high-fives from guys. But Morgan takes his glove off, shakes my hand, wow. and puts his glove back on. Oh, so see you later. He's just, he, he's just a nice, quality kid. Uh, who is going to be even better than he's got now. He's going to be a real good so. player. And um, we'll see what happens. So one thing I'm curious about, we Bill just asked about, you know, the crowd and, and feeling like the buzz is back in the building. There's always a lot of talk about the idea that the players feed off of the crowd, and then the crowd feeds off the players, and it's kind of a big loop. And that's how a building gets exciting. It gets, it gets exciting, and that's how, every, the, that's how you get the energy in the building. Sure. But for you, for, you know, for your job, your, your longtime job as the, as the PA announcer at the Wells Fargo Center for the Flyers, do you feed off the crowd as well? Are you part of that? Do you, do you feel that energy when you're, when you're calling, when you're announcing things? 
Yeah, generally I do. Uh, I try to be professional about the whole thing, and and um, you know the only thing that has really gotten out of hand and has its own life is the Pico power play. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I can't tell you Iconic. how many people ask me about that today. And uh, could you say it? Could you say it? I, I just don't say it <laughs> on the band. I don't do it on the band. No. Yeah. But uh, I mean, you? you know, I save it. But uh, that has gotten its own life. Um, I just try to, you know, our goals are fine, and I do those the way I do them. And the other goals, I don't. I'm not like some guys where they'll say uh, the Valerius goal was good. You know, I, I don't want to do that because they're scoring goals, man. That's important. Yeah. That's an accomplishment. So I try and make that uh, at least listenable and um, you know uh, I saw Hazy after he scored Kevin and he said I'm glad I'm glad you did my goal this actually <laughs> sounded like a goal I said yeah yeah uh, but um, you know it's I, I could feel it for the crowd and lately there's been uh, 18 plus 19 in here and um, it's all related to the fact that they like to watch these guys yeah these guys are guys they like and um I thought they did a real good job at the uh, 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 the, the uh, was it March eighth. Oh, the training deadline. Training yeah, deadline. Yeah, yeah, and they I did. thought they did a good job there. They they brought in uh, uh, Johnson, that defenseman. Uh, Seventy seven was a lot of uh, you know experience, but yeah. he still got to fit in with everybody. Mm -hmm. That's part of the problem. It takes time. Yeah, uh, but uh, all in all, you know, it's much more exciting. It I is. feed off it. The answer, short answer, is yes. Uh, but the long answer is what I just told you. <laughs> I have a very important question for you. Go right ahead. Where did you get that incredible button that you're wearing? Look this, at this one? Yes. Oh, that's a vintage button from days Kiss going me, by. I'm really? flyerish. Yeah, I That's had, incredible. That's Can you have someone boy. put that in the store for us? Because I would buy that in a second. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where I got it, but uh, I've had it a it's long great. while. It's been with my buttons. Nice. Throw the buttons one place, you know. Usually I had it sticking on the board. Mm. Never think it'd be too many. You move them off and put them someplace and <laughs> pull them out when they're important. But I got a Valentine's one and I got this one. Oh, it's fun. Hey, I got a lot of Stanley Cup buttons back in the day. <laughs> nice. Sterling silver Stanley Cups that the league used to give out to their press pins. They're oh, nice. Wow. Yeah. I, I bet you have that. a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a lot of stuff. What would you say? Because they've obviously been doing this carnival in some form or another for decades now. Do you have a, uh, a favorite Flyers Carnival memory that, uh, that sticks oh. in your head? Uh, well, I've ridden the first wheel. Uh, I've, uh, oh, yeah, I guess I do have one. When I pulled out my kazoo and kazooed with the <laughs> band here a few years ago, we had That's a band amazing. here called Jelly Roll, which is really a good band. Oh, yeah. okay. Great band. And uh, they played some songs, and uh, I, I was kazooing down down on the floor and they said come on up I came up and I just went crazy I had a good time and it was fun it was fun I thought it was uh, awesome. Lou this was a ton of fun thank you so much for joining us uh, legendary PA announcer here for the Philadelphia Flyers couldn't be more excited to uh, be able to share a few minutes with you today well it's an honor to be on the show with you guys and lady thank you and uh, <laughs> we'd just like to say thanks for having me and uh, let's go Flyers yeah let's, let's go, go Flyers. Flyers thanks so much Lou. Right. thanks for thanks, your time Lou. right that's Lou Nolan, PA announcer here, uh, long-time well, legend. legend of Philadelphia. Absolutely awesome to get to uh, chat with him for a few minutes. Just leave it. Now, I got to talk to you about my friends over at Coors Light. Uh, we are, uh, it's actually awesome. It worked out today that we're here in this in this chill zone, the Coors Light chill zone at the Wells Fargo Center. Thank you so much. Uh, this team, Thank you so much. whether we're happy, Oh, thank you very much, Lou. Whether <laughs> we're happy about now. result, whether Formal. we're a little disappointed, sometimes we just have to chill in how we're talking about them, and that's why very chill right we now. need to chill with an ice-cold Coors Light. Whether you're freaking out about the goaltenders, injuries, the draft lottery, don't think we're going to have to worry about it. Uh, it seems like, I mean, Dan Hilferty told us they're making it, so, you know, he said 100%. He said definitely. 100%. Yeah. That's what I heard. All right. <laughs> look, look, look at it. this way. Even if the Flyers do end up in the draft lottery, they're not going to have great odds. <laughs> well, 13 <laughs> so, to 2. It happened you never before. Know. You never Whether know. Whether you're freaking out about any of those things, you need to find the Blue Mountains in your fridge and enjoy a beer as cold as the Rockies. Because when everything surrounding your favorite hockey team is on fire, sometimes you just got to chill. When you choose to rise above it all, choose chill, choose Coors Light, get Coors Coors Light delivered straight to your door with Instacart by going to CoorsLight.com slash PHLY. Hockey, 
That's CoorsLight.com slash P-H-L-Y-H-O-C-K-E-Y. Celebrate responsibly. Coors Brewing Company, Golden, Colorado. All right, and uh, thank you so much to everyone here at the Wells Fargo Center, here at the Flyers Charities Carnival. This was so cool getting to do this show today. Charlie and I... A little less than two hours from now, we're going to be in the dunk tank. Yeah, so Get on, baby. If you're watching, you're like, oh, do I really want to go? Oh, you want to go. The carnival is always an awesome time. You can come down at 2 o'clock. Dunk Charlie and I will be uh, will be down there. I don't have the orange tux. I got something a little special for everyone. Oh, here we go. St. Patty's Day. Here we go. Uh, but this was a lot of fun, It guys. was. It was, yeah. And I definitely want to thank uh, you know all of Dan Hilferty, Keith Jones, and Lou Nolan for, uh, for joining us live. It's incredible. Uh, it's really cool. It's really so cool to cool. do these events. I'm really looking forward to... Uh, to taking a, a walk around and seeing everything with all the people. Because you, you can see it when it's empty, but it's different when nah, everyone's it's, here. It's, no, like, I mean, when we came in, it was just like the volunteers kind of yeah. messing yeah. around playing cornhole, and now there's like Flyers players playing. Yeah, Mark you said we got Mark back Stahl. Mark Stahl's back. It was yeah. Like back. Yeah, look I mean, at that. That's yeah. amazing. I'm gonna- Get my credit card, and I'm going to walk around here and spend an inordinate amount of money doing nonsense. <laughs> Kelly Love is that. about to single-handedly fund the yeah. uh, Ed Snyder hockey program. You guys <laughs> might have to, like, fight me because I might spend, like, $7,000 dunking Charlie and Bill <laughs> over and over again. Oh, that's perfect. I make no promises. As long as, we, as long as we get it for social, it'll be great. But thanks to everyone. Thanks to Coors Light for uh, sponsoring us today and for all their our adventure yesterday. They were behind it all, our uh, pregame and the watch party. Weird. I had a great time. It was a lot of fun. It was also an adventure. It was a, it was something we hadn't done before. No, I thought no, it, was it was great. It was neat. And it was uh, that was presented by Coors Light, and they are one of our sponsors today as well here in the Chill Zone. All right, that'll do it for us. My name is Bill Matz. That's Kelly Hinkle and Charlie O'Connor. We'll be back next week with more PHLY Flyers. Until then, have a great St. Paddy's, Philly.